of your previous books. Yeah, um, I, I'm certainly very glad to be here, Lee. And I, uh, you're right about that. Uh, about five years ago, I wrote a book called Band of Giants, uh, and I wanted to give a a really um, uh, uh, an overview of the Revolutionary War that was easy reading. And I focused on a lot of the uh, American officers who are some of the lesser known people, figures in the war, such as uh, Daniel Morgan and uh, Henry Knox and people like that, that aren't everyday names. Um, and in writing that book, I came across Benedict Arnold and some of the things Benedict Arnold had done. And one of them was this uh, campaign on Lake Champlain in Northern New York uh, in 1776. And um, I was just surprised at how little had been written about it. It had not been the subject of too many books and it was uh, just generally neglected. Uh, so I, I got interested in it and decided to do a, an entire book about that. Well, that's, that's great. Um, I, uh, I think that we are about ready to get started. Um, let, me, uh, let me welcome folks. I am Lee Wright. I'm the founder of History Camp. I'm your Boston. And with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these History Camp discussions to you each week. Tonight, we are excited to welcome Jack Kelly. Jack is a historian, journalist, and novelist. He is noted for his evocative prose and his ability to bring history to life. His books include Band of Giants, which received the DARS History Award Medal. He has contributed to national periodicals, including the Wall Street Journal, and is a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow. He has appeared on the History Channel and has been interviewed on National Public Radio. He lives and works in New York's Hudson Valley. He's joining us tonight to talk about his new book, Valcor, the 1776 Campaign that saves, saved the cause of liberty. Thank you so much for joining us, Jack. Harry, it's great to be with you and um, I'm, I'm glad to greet everybody that's tuning in. in indeed. So uh, one of the things that I, I think all of us that that, that enjoy history, uh, are especially interested in, is finding out about important things that we had no idea about. And, and this is one that I think may fall into that category. Why is it that this is so um, unknown? Well, uh, Lee, I usually uh, cite the uh, great book, really one of the excellent histories of the war, called 1776 by David McCullough. It's one of our premier narrative historians. And that book was about the war in 1776, and it didn't mention the Northern campaign whatsoever. It didn't un underplay it, it just didn't mention it at all. And I got to wondering, like, why is that? The, what's, the, what's the reason for that? And I think it has to do with Benedict Arnold, that uh, Arnold was... Um, uh, s such a reviled character that everything that he um, had to do with was downplayed. And it was much easier to tell the story of George Washington, even though George Washington's campaign in New York was a failure, um, it was redeemed by his attack on uh, Trenton and defeating the Hessians at Trenton. Well, let's let's then back up, and I, I think it'd be helpful for folks set the stage of uh, what, what's where are we at in the war, what's going on, and and what are some of the strategic issues on both sides. Well, in July of 1776, um, the Patriots had just declared independence, but the military situation that they faced was dire. Um, the British had sent over the largest expeditionary force in their history, and they were determined to put down the rebellion that year by force. Um, the target for, the, um, for that army was a corridor that ran from Quebec City uh, down the St. Lawrence River, down the Richelieu River, uh, and then down the Lake Champlain and Lake George to the Hudson River and all the way down to New York. That was the access to the interior of America. Uh, it was the only path really to, into the colonies from Canada. And in particular, it was the back door to New England. So that if the British were to, to get onto um, 
the lakes or onto the Hudson River, they could attack the New England states, which were the, the, really the seat of the rebellion at that time. Um, and their strategy was to, um, to attack that quarter from both ends. So they sent a 10,000-man army to Canada, and they sent a larger army to New York City and really spent the next two years, uh, uh, that was their focus of the war. Um, the Patriots understood the strategic importance of that corridor because the year before they'd used it to invade Canada and they'd gone from uh, Ticonderoga and Crown Point, which were well down on Lake Champlain. They'd, they'd gone by water northward, taken Montreal, went up the St. Lawrence River and got to, um, to this Quebec City. Um, you don't hear a lot about the uh, invasion of Canada in history books, I think for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it was a little embarrassing that the freedom-loving patriots, the first, their first inclination was to invade another province. And also because it was a complete disaster. Uh, that, uh, not being able to take uh, Quebec, which was a fortified city, they, um, uh, when that 10,000-man army came over from England and landed in the spring in Canada, uh, the American effort totally collapsed, and they retreated a couple hundred miles back to where they had started at Ticonderoga and Crown Point. Um, they lost a lot of their equipment. They had lost a lot of men. Um, they were, the morale was very low, they were very disorganized. And one of the worst things was that they'd contracted smallpox while they were in Canada. So that of the 5,000 men who came back from Canada, 3,000 of them were sick with smallpox and had to be quarantined. So um, that was the army though, that had to stop this invasion that they knew was coming from Canada. Um, and, um, it was a, a pretty dire situation. Well, now, Fort Ticonderoga, as you said, had been captured by the Americans in 1775. Um, was there a, a fear, a possibility that they would lose it in this, in this campaign? Well, yes, that, that was the fear. And um, I think that the, uh, as I was talking about, we were talking about the, um, uh, how everything to do with Benedict Arnold was downplayed. The capture of uh, Ticonderoga in 1775, uh, which was uh, Benedict Arnold and uh, Ethan Allen had combined to take that fort. And then Arnold had the foresight to uh, rush up to Canada, actually invaded Canada the year before without any orders and took uh, control of one of the uh, only um, warships that was on Lake Champlain and captured it for the Americans. So the Americans had what they called the mastery of the lake up there. That was a great disincentive for the British to be able to come down because they were, they were going to have to build their own fleet. So um, I think it, it, it gives an indication of Arnold's um, uh, sense of initiative and aggressiveness that Congress actually considered giving back Fort Ticonderoga to the British. They thought th that uh, Allen and um, Arnold had gone too far. They hadn't authorized them to take over one of the king's forts, and uh, the, the number of cannon were there, which was a, a crucial reason for taking it over as well, was to get the cannon that the British had uh, sort of stockpiled in both of those forts. Um, so the, the Congress was really catching up to these these guys that were very uh, aggressive in, in pushing the war, and it really did push the uh, Patriots into uh, all-out war with Britain, which uh, at the time there was, uh, in, uh, through a good part of 1775, there was just a lot of talk of reconciliation that went on even into the next year. Um, and uh, it became less and less likely as they pushed the war forward. Well, I certainly think it'd be uh, it's a fair characterization uh, to say that uh, uh, someone like uh, Benedict Arnold is uh, taking his own initiative when he's uh, invading another country and, and no one ordered him to do so. Um, so what, what role did uh, Gates and uh, Schuyler play in this whole matter? Uh, well, of the three uh, 
uh, commanders in the Northern Army. The, there was really two armies at that point. George Washington was in New York, and the, the Northern Army was under the overall command of Philip Schuyler. Um, Philip Schuyler was a um, uh, uh, Albany aristocrat. He sp actually spoke Dutch at home, which I, I was sort of interested to find out. And Albany at that time was a completely Dutch-speaking town. Um, he was a lukewarm patriot, or he was considered to be. Uh, he was not for independence. Um, he had virtually no battle experience, though he'd been in the French and Indian War. And he was kind of a sickly man, and he tended to command from his mansion in Albany. So his, his field officer, his man on the spot at Fort Ticonderoga, was uh, Horatio Gates. Gates was a very experienced military man, uh, had been in the British Army for years. and um, But like Schuyler, he was not really a battle leader. He was mainly an, a staff officer, an administrative man. And uh, he, he also had a very exalted view of himself, and he was uh, always, all through the war, he was plotting as how he was going to push Washington aside and take over as the commander of the overall commander of the Continental Army. And then the third man that would actually be leading the charge against the enemy was Benedict Arnold. Arnold had no training whatsoever, uh, military training before the war. And, uh, of course, four years later, he would uh, betray his country. So it seemed like these were the second string uh, officers that had been put in command of this very vital operation. Um, but strangely enough, it, they, they turned out to be the right men for the job. Uh, Schuyler was really a genius of logistics. He, he had been a businessman for many years, had a lot of connections, he knew how to go out and, and buy the supplies they needed to build a fleet on Lake Champlain, which was lar largely in the wilderness, um, and how to get this material up there uh, and um, to pay for it and so forth. Um, he's really set up an early version of the military industrial complex. Uh, Gates was a genius of organization. G Gates. Um, uh, from his administrative uh, experience in the British Army, he knew how to restore morale. He knew how to restore discipline. Uh, he knew how to deal with the smallpox. And in particular, he knew how to refortify um, Fort Ticonderoga, which was, had largely fallen into ruins. Um, both the forts, Ticonderoga and Crown Point, uh, had been um, built to protect against the French. And once the French were pushed out of Canada, and uh, the British no longer really had any need for that kind of defense. And then Benedict Arnold was um, really a genius of war itself. He had his uncanny knack for uh, strategy and tactics, a very aggressive, inspired leader of men. Uh, and as a bonus, Arnold had been a sea captain um, before the war. So he knew about boats and sailing, and um, that was exactly what was needed uh, to build this fleet and confront the British on the lake. Let's let's stay with Arnold for just a minute. Um, so, one of our our guests some weeks ago was characterizing Arnold as as Washington's best general when he was still on our side, as it were. Um, where did this this um, and a brilliant military insight and drive and so forth come from, uh, because it certainly doesn't sound like it came from being a member of the British Army. Uh, and as you were just explaining, there's no other no other training there. Uh, I, I think that the one thing, uh, or probably a couple of things we can point to, one is that um, by being a sea captain uh, and, and uh, a lot of merchants would send ships out to the West Indies and to Canada or to Britain, he actually was the captain of his ships, and he would go down to the West Indies. He would trade down there. That was a pretty rough um, duty. There's the, the the there was piracy. There was the the guys that manned these sailing ships were tough people, and they you had to be very commanding uh, to prevent them from cheating you or taking over the ship, mutinying, uh, standing up to pirates whatever. Uh, 
that gave me to what the, the skills that were required to, to, to be a military officer as well. Uh, and also just being a businessman, it was just, uh, you, you had a, a, a way with people, you had to uh, have a lot of planning, foresight. And so his years as a merchant, uh, and he was one of the more successful merchants in the country, um, also prepared him. But other than that, I think we just have to say he was, he had the personality, he had the nature uh, that happened to to jibe with. He was a natural soldier. And there's, there were not a lot of natural sh soldiers on the American side in the revolution. And he was one of them. Right. Uh, well, talk to us about his plan then. Um, it, it really started with a, an arms race. Uh, the, the two sides um, uh, were building fleets. The British had to build their fleet in a, a town called St. John's at the very top of um, Lake Champlain because there were rapids between the St. Lawrence River and, and Lake Champlain. But at St. John's, you could sail right out onto the lake. So they were building at the very northern end of Lake Champlain. Americans were building their fleet at the very southern end of Lake Champlain. And um, the, the Americans started out with this uh, uh, sloop of war that um, Benedict Arnold had captured the year before. They had a couple of schooners that they'd fitted out with cannon. And they started building um, gunboats. And um, the gunboats were about 50 feet long. They, sometimes, they were sometimes called gondolas. They, were, uh, they carried three pretty good sized cannon. Um, they were easy to build. That was their main attribute. They were had a flat bottom, um, and they did have a sail, but because they had no keel, they were very difficult to sail unless the wind was directly from behind. So they're basically oversized rowboats. Um, as I say, about 50, I think they were 53 feet long. Um, that was the that was the easiest, and that was the what they started building. They wanted to build a, a, what were called row galleys, which were a little bit bigger, um, about 74 feet long. And those were um, um, boats that did have a keel that were handy for sailing on the lake and also could be rowed. They were somewhat like the galleys that they used to, used to use on the Mediterranean back in the Roman days and even before that. But they were very difficult to build because they needed a, a, an experienced shipwright to have that shape tall and down to the keel. Uh, so they had a lot of trouble getting those built. Uh, they were hard to rig out and so forth. Um, so those were, the, those were the projects that were going on in um, this town of Skeensboro, what's now called Whitehall on Lake Champlain. Uh, and um, meanwhile, they were fortifying Fort Ticonderoga, and I would just add as a as a uh, to give a little context. While this arms race was going on, George Washington was um, confronting with a he had an army of about twenty thousand men in New York City, and the British landed forty thousand men in um, uh, Staten Island. They defeated the Americans very handily at the Battle of Long Island in August. Uh, in September, they took New York City. Washington barely escaped with his army. And um, in October, they were fighting up in White Plains, which north of New York City. And by November, Washington was retreating across New Jersey and ended up on the other side of the Delaware River in Pennsylvania. Uh, totally defeated. His 20,000-man army was now down to 3,000 men. And he wrote to his brother at that time, and he said, I think the game is pretty near up. And that was really one of the low points of, of the Revolutionary War, is that um, he, he thought there was little chance they would come back. So that made the, the um, operation in um, the north all that much more important, to stop that invasion from the north, because that would have pretty much sealed the fate of the Patriots. Um, as far as... Uh, Benedict Arnold went, he had a very keen sense of time in warfare, um, taking the initiative, getting the jump on the enemy. Um, and so rather than wait until they finished the fleet, he took a, in August, he took a, a, 
uh, the boats that they did have done, which were uh, six um, gunboats, he had one schooner that was armed, and uh, they went up to the north end of Lake Champlain. And he had a couple of objectives up there, but really three things he was trying to do up there. One was he needed to train his crews. Uh, the the, the uh, crews in the, um, in the gunboats were drawn mostly from the army. This was really an army operation, even though it was on the water. Uh, and a lot of these guys didn't, really didn't know how to sail at all. Uh, he wanted to gain intelligence uh, on the British, who were just a little bit farther north, uh, building their fleet. And in particular, he wanted himself and his um, his captains of the gunboats to learn the terrain. And you can see in this map that how complex the north end of Lake Champlain is. There's many, many islands, little coves and inlets. And he wanted them to go around and, and take soundings find out how deep they were, uh, where they could go, where they couldn't go, uh, and generally uh, get a, a feel for the lake. Um, this was very hard service. The, the, the gunboats in particular were, um, as I said, was essentially open rowboats. And it gets pretty cold in northern New York in September. This is up north of the Adirondack Mountains. Um, there were no berths. There were no hammocks. Uh, the men slept on the deck. These 50-foot boats, there were, the crew was 44 men, so it was, uh, it was, they were crowded as well. Um, a lot of storms come down Lake Champlain in the fall. Uh, they lacked warm clothes. They lacked uh, gunpowder. They lacked, uh, um, in particular, the galleys, the row galleys, because they hadn't finished those yet. So there's, uh, Arnold's constantly complaining to, to General Gates, where are the row galleys? Why aren't you sending them up to us? Um, and then at the end of September, he decided to move the fleet down to Valcour Island, which is a little bit south on the lake, closer to Crown Point. Um, it was uh, an area where they could um, uh, be protected. There's a Valcour Island is about a mile off of the New York shore, and it was a, a large enough that it was uh, it was protected, and it, it um, uh, had a little cove that they where they could put the boats, and um, it was also hidden so that the, if any any um, fleet coming down the lake would. Uh, uh, be on, would not be able to see them. So uh, at one, when he got down there, they finally did get three galleys up to him. It's now getting into October. Uh, and uh, so finally they got these galleys and they brought up some warm clothes. They brought up uh, some more supplies and uh, in particular uh, a, a barrel of rum for each of the uh, gunboats, which they were, was very welcome. Um, and he continued to wait and was really puzzled over why the British didn't come down the lake. What, what was going on there um, with, uh, with Carlton? Why the, why the delay? Why the hesitancy? Um, well, they, they soon found out uh, cause, because on October 11th, uh, the, the scout boats came in and they said they, they, um, seen a sail on the horizon, and they began to see the size of the fleet that the British had, had built, and it was quite extraordinary that the British had, um, and of course the British, the Americans were uh, trying to just cobble a fleet together uh, in its kind of amateur way, but uh, General Carleton, this is a picture of uh, Guy Carleton, who was the, both the governor of Canada and the military commander there, very capable soldier, uh, he decided he wanted a lot of firepower when he came down the lake. And uh, he had the capability to do it because he had the Royal Navy. Uh, they couldn't sail the boats up the Rishi River, but they had plenty of supplies. They had, they had um, built in England uh, about 20 gunboats, which they had then taken apart and they were like 
prefab kits that they could then put together at, at uh, St. John's. <clears throat> they dragged, so they partially took apart some schooners, dragged them up and put them back together. But the main thing was that they, uh, he, he wanted to have a frigate. Now that was an ocean going ship and they'd been in the process of building one at uh, Quebec City uh, before the war even started. And they took, uh, and this is, a, is sort of a generic view of a frigate of that time. This was a three-masted uh, square rig uh, ship, unlike anything that had been seen on Lake Champlain or any lake, really. Um, massive broadside of 12-pounder cannon, really as much firepower practically as the whole American fleet. Um, but it took time to build and to get it all rigged, as you can imagine, that even though they had expert um, uh, shipwrights and all the sailors from the Royal Navy. Uh, but he had that finished. And that, that took a month to finish, which was really the month uh, from uh, mid-September uh, into October 11th uh, that Arnold had been waiting and waiting. Uh, finally, he, they came down with this massive fleet. Um, and I think General Carleton was like a lot of generals who just uh, well, if you got 10 ships, why not have 20? You know, he wanted more. And he was a cautious man, but I think all this firepower gave him a lot of confidence so he came down that morning. Um, but the delay had consequences, and I, you know, go into that in a minute, but why uh, that long delay was um, uh, proved to be very consequential for, for Carleton's uh, operation. Well, let's let's do that. It does seem that this this kind of classic uh, military question, right? Do I build up a large uh, supply, men, whatever, and and have that, and then go forward, or right, seize the initiative, right, move quickly, and so on? Yeah, and that that was that was the direct uh, where where uh, General Carleton and Benedict Arnold were directly uh, opposites. That Arnold believed. Uh, that speed and, and qu uh, a quick strike was much more effective than just waiting to build up your armaments. And partly it was out of necessity because Americans just didn't have the capability to build a huge fleet that they had to, they had to go with what, and it, and it proved in, I think in many cases in the Revolutionary War, uh, it, it, it tended to turn to their advantage because they didn't, uh, they didn't have the bureaucracy, they didn't have the tradition that really stultified, to a certain extent, the British uh, operations of the British Army. Indeed. Well, t take it, take us through this battle. How did it play out? Uh, well, as, as soon as the British, uh, as soon as the, the Americans realized that they were coming, the British were coming down on them, and with the size of fleet that they had, uh, Arnold called a council of war. He was on one of the galleys uh, as his flagship, and his. Um, his second in command said, we have to get out of here. We have to retreat right now. Uh, it would be suicidal to stay and face that fleet with what we have. Um, Arnold presented his plan to his officers uh, and they did vote to stay and fight. And I think that he, Arnold either assumed or in, just intuited somehow, it's kind of read Carleton's mind he's not gonna come down the lake unless the wind is from the north, which at his back. And if, as he comes down the lake, he's going to assume that the Americans had already retreated. Uh, that would have been the logical thing. So he's gonna to try to catch up to them before they can get down to, to the safety of Fort Ticonderoga, which had some substantial guns. So he's gonna be in a hurry. He's not gonna spend the time to look behind every island and look inside of every cove and um, and that's exactly what happened. It was just like it was Arnold was able to put himself in Carleton's place, and that's exactly what Carleton did. Arnold let him go by Valcour Island. They were a couple of miles south of Valcour Island. He sent a couple of ships out to fire at them from behind. So the British then, provoked by this firing, um, had to turn around and sailed north into the wind and into the uh, this rather narrow bay, so it was barely a mile wide. And the large British ships were unable to do that. They could not tack back and forth enough against the wind 
particularly a square rig ship, it was almost impossible to go against the wind. So they ended up as spectators during the entire battle. The, they had 22 gunboats, which were uh, very similar to the American gunboats, essentially oversized rowboats, and they were able to row into Valcour Bay. The Americans had formed a, a line of battle across from the island to the New York shore, and the British did the same thing. And then they just started to fire at each other. Um, and I go into the book and try to emphasize the brutality. Um, and yeah, in this map, you can see uh, it's not a real accurate map of the terrain, but it shows the dynamics of the battle. The British large ships uh, are just sitting out there to the south. And there's a line of, uh, of British gunboats facing a line of American gunboats. And there's one one British schooner did um, uh, was able to get up into the battle and was shot up pretty bad by the Americans. And the whole thing was a cannon battle. It was just shooting back and forth, um, very chaotic. One of the most brutal forms of warfare at that period uh, because there was nowhere to hide. There was no taking cover. Uh, the, the cannonballs would blast through the sides of the ship. Uh, very noisy. Uh, people that were killed in the battle, got hit by a cannonball, uh, would just be thrown over, overboard. Uh, th this is a, a picture of the 12-pounder uh, cannon that would have been on the front of a, an American gunboat. So they're pretty substantial guns. And the Americans were fighting to keep the British from breaking their line. If they'd gotten through, uh, and particularly of the larger ships, they, they would have no, that, that would have been curtains for the Americans. Um, but they were able to hold them off seven hours of fighting back, you know, shooting back and forth at each other. And, um, and then it got dark. Uh, and it was pretty much the battle was essentially a draw. Um, each side lost one gunboat. The American uh, boat, uh, the Philadelphia, uh, sank right after dark as the battle ended. The Americans had used up three quarters of their ammunition, and uh, they knew they were pretty much sitting ducks uh, in the morning because uh, the British had these, uh, particularly if the wind were to shift around anywhere from directly from the north, the British would be able to sail down on top of them. So sure. they, um, this, it seemed like the choice was to either to surrender or to um, wait there to be slaughtered. And Arnold came up with a, another alternative, which was to escape. And uh, it turned out that all the learning the lake, the uh, taking the soundings and learning the terrain paid off for them because they were able to form a line of, sh of their ships um, and, and go along the New York shore and avoid the, the British fleet that was sitting right there waiting for them but that was afraid to get too close to the shore because they, they were not that familiar with the, the lay of the land there um, and in the dark. And one of the factors I you know, usually point out to is almost everybody there would have been uh, partially deaf because of the firing of the cannon. If you get, you're close, particularly in a boat where you're firing cannon that's two feet away from you, uh, the noise would, would leave you... Um, uh, largely deaf. So that helped the Americans. Uh, they just very quietly snuck away. And they began rowing down the lake. Um, the, w the wind did shift around to the south then, so they had to row into the wind, but still they got a, a pretty good head start. The British uh, waited until it got light, and then they were flabbergasted to see the bay was empty. And they began then uh, a, another a, a chase that lasted two days going south on Lake Champlain. Uh, the Americans had the head start, but the British ships were faster, uh, and eventually they caught up to them. There was another battle. Um, they captured one of the American galleys and about 100 men with it. Uh, and Arnold ended up um, with, with four gunboats and his galley and fought it out with the British for another two and a half hours. Uh, finally ran his entire, what was left of his fleet, into a small uh, bay down on the uh, Vermont, what's now the Vermont side of uh, uh, Lake Champlain. 
and burned the boats so the British wouldn't get them and left the flags flying. He wouldn't surrender them because he didn't want the British to. Um, and this, this, yeah, that that map shows um, the mark on the right there is Paris Bay. That's that's where as far as they got, uh, and they were almost down to Crown Point, which is down at the bottom of that picture. Um, and um, he then walked with his men down to Crown Point and uh, finally to Fort Ticonderoga, and, and that was really the end of the uh, of the fight on the lake. Uh, and uh, I, I usually point out that that Fer Ferris Bay was renamed Arnold Bay, and it's one of the few, very few places uh, named in the United States for Benedict Arnold in honor of Benedict Arnold. What a fascinating, uh, fascinating story, a series of engagements. Uh, I, really, really interesting. Um, I want to go to one of the things that you mentioned that people, I believe, can still see today. I saw just a few weeks ago. Um, and that is the gunboat Philadelphia. And then after that, we'll see if there, what questions we have. Uh, so where, where did that end up ultimately? The, the Philadelphia? Yes. Well, um, the, the boat sat, the, that gunboat sat on the bottom of uh, uh, Lake Champlain in that bay uh, off of Alcor Island for 159 years. And in the 1930s, um, some divers went down, found it, and were able to salvage it, and they brought it up. Uh, it then was um, uh, sent to the um, Smithsonian and ended up is now on display in the Smithsonian Institute. And one of the reasons I like to talk about it is to me, it's really one of the most poignant relics of the Revolutionary War, um, partly because it, it really expresses something of the reality of the war. This is not a replica, it's not a model of a boat. This is the actual boat that fought the British. This is, these are the actual guns that fired the British. In fact, that, that bow cannon was still loaded when they brought it up. And you can see over on the, on the far left, just below that anchor that's there, is the ball that was fired into the side of the Philadelphia. It was found still lodged there uh, that, that sank it. And the planks of that uh, boat uh, actually did absorb the blood of men who fought for the independence of the country. So I, I think it's one of the, really one of the most poignant of the, um, of the relics of the entire Revolutionary War. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago uh, at the Smithsonian and saw that. And, and indeed, it, it, is, it is really remarkable. It's, this is the ship. Right, this is that boat. Yeah. Uh, right. Again, not a, not a model of mock-up or reconstruction or anything like that. Um, well, let me let me bring in Carrie. But before we do that, let me also encourage folks to share their thoughts about tonight's discussion. What did you feel were some of the most important uh, new obs new insights? The most important kind of points and additions to your understanding of the Revolutionary War. And you can do that via email to ideas at historycamp.org. We uh, may choose to include some of those on the uh, on the page that will have this uh, this this video posted. So uh, let's uh, let's go now to Carrie and and questions that she has. All right, um, you refer to Valcor as the most important unknown battle of the Revolutionary War. Why was it important, and why is it unknown? I usually, I usually um, point to two things that were really the importance of the battle. Uh, the first one is that 1776 was the best chance the British had to win the war outright. Uh, later in the war, they had other chances to come to negotiated settlements, but to actually win the war, defeat the Patriots, uh, 1776 was the year they had the preponderance of force the Americans were at their weakest, and um, the Americans had no allies. So if they were going to do it, that was, uh, that was the year. And the fact that this campaign narrowly prevented them from winning the war um, 
both the 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 delay of building the ships and and the uh, on uh, both sides had to spend the summer building the ships, and then the battle itself, which further delayed. Uh, General Carleton ended up in Crown Point. They did were able to take Crown Point, uh, but by then it was November, and he decided that um, it was just too late in the season. Um, that he was afraid that the lake would freeze behind him and. Uh, and he would be trapped down there, uh, uh, trying to besiege uh, Fort Ticonderoga. So he decided it made more sense to go go back to Montreal and wait till the next year. And I, you know, I think people that are familiar with the history of the war realize that it wasn't uh, General Carleton that came down the next year, but it was General Burgoyne uh, who had forced him out as commander. And uh, Burgoyne came down and and did take Ticonderoga, and then. Uh, met his end at uh, Saratoga. Um, so that delay and that, that uh, uh, it was, the battle was certainly not a victory for the Americans. They lost most of their fleet, but it was, it, it pushed back the, um, the, the gave, gave them a new lease on life for another year. Um, the other reason I think that I say that it's important was that after the British went back to, um, to um, Montreal, um, General Gates and General Arnold um, took 600 men and marched down all the way to Pennsylvania to join Washington's army. So Washington was trying to make a decision, which was to, um, you know, what factors he consider, we don't know. But the, the fact that the, the threat from the north had been neutralized and he had these 600 additional men um, may have given him the confidence to risk his whole army and go across the Delaware River, attack um, the Hessians at Trenton, and win, win what was really a crucial victory um, for the Americans to restore morale and really keep the war going. Uh, and some of the men who fought it, um, at um, Valcour Island in October also crossed the Delaware and fought at Trenton in December on Christmas. Uh, they cr crossed over on Christmas night. So um, I think that's another reason why uh, it was very, uh, very important campaign. Um, as far as why, uh, you know, I spoke earlier about why it was unknown, and uh, I think it, it largely is has to do with uh, Benedict Arnold that he we, nobody wanted to to um, get too involved in anything that Benedict Arnold was in, except for Saratoga, which was, which uh, his role, I think, was downplayed a little bit. He was then very uh, effective at Saratoga as well. So um, uh, there's, there's an element, I think, also, it was pretty remote. And even today, I mean, uh, not too many people go up to to Valcour Island. There's nothing much to see there. The, the, the DAR did put up a plaque to commemorate the battle, but there, there isn't much to see. And it's just, it's way up there. It's, you know, not too far from Canada. So it's, it was remote then and it's remote now. Right. Okay. So did the British try again to split the New England colonies via the Hudson River after this, or was that not a strategy any longer? Yeah, the the next year they continued exactly the same strategy. Uh, they already now controlled New York, um, and they had ideas of going up the. Um, uh, the logical thing, of course, would have been for to go north uh, up the Hudson River and come down from Canada at the same time, uh, for reasons that are seem to be very complicated and hard to understand. Um, General Howe, who was in New York, decided to change his, shift his strategy and attack Philadelphia, which he did and he captured Philadelphia, but that uh, left Burgoyne kind of hanging there coming down from the north and Burgoyne was able to take Ticonderoga, but he um, got stuck in between there and Albany and um, and uh, the Americans had time and, the, and more resources to throw against him and, uh, and defeated him at Saratoga and that course, was always considered the turning point of the war. I, whether it is or not, it's been argued back and forth, but it was certainly a huge, huge uh, battle for the Americans to win and, uh, 
And after that, the, the war shifted to the south, and a lot of the fighting uh, later in the war was down in, in the southern states and um, uh, the sort of continued along a different trajectory. Right. Okay, one last question. If Arnold left the lake and burned his boats, why didn't the British claim victory and take charge of the lake? Why did they? Why didn't they? Well, uh, after they went back to um, Montreal for the winter and spent the winter there, they did come down and, and they, because there was no opposition on the lake, they were able to quite quickly, uh, by the time the beginning of July, when the whole thing started in 1775, uh, the, the British had already captured Ticonderoga. So they then um, um, had control of the lake for the rest of the war. They, they never gave it up, uh, just as they had control of New York City for the entire war. But they never were able to get farther than that after the defeat at Saratoga, and they were never able to, um, to move north. Um, I, I, kind of ironically, one of the 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 key thing to Benedict Arnold's betrayal was that he wanted to give up um, uh, West Point to the British, which would have opened up the Hudson River. And uh, fortunately, he was not able to do that. So, All right. Thank you. This has just been great. We're so glad you joined us tonight. We have a link to Jack's book in the chat, and it is very enjoyable to read. And there's, of course, lots of details there we didn't have time to unpack tonight. So make sure to check that out. We also have a link to his website where you can learn more about him and the books that he has written. And you probably have heard us talk about our print of Fort Ticonderoga. That is art that the Pursuit of History commissioned to commemorate Fort Ticonderoga. And if you would like to check that out, we have a link to that in the chat as well. Now, there are a few things that you can do to help us keep these history camp discussions going and growing. You can share the information with your friends, tell them about it, and tell them to join us. You can share our social posts, our emails, and if you're not on our email list, you can sign up at historycamp.org and consider making a donation to The Pursuit of History. That is the nonprofit that supports these discussions. And next week, join us again. We will be speaking with Terry Mort about the Battle of Beecher Island, which happened in Colorado in 1868 between a large band of Cheyenne and Sioux warriors and about 50 American troops. So that is a, another unknown but fascinating story, and we hope you'll join us then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Have a good Thank night. You, Thank you. Thanks.